research yesterday and I came across this really cool um, quote that this was a James Baldwin article that was written. I want to say I, I didn't photograph the date. I know there were a couple of articles. I think this is one from like 70 something um, where he is talking about the state of Israel was not created for the salvation of Jews. It was created for the salvation of the Western interests. This is what is becoming clear. The Palestinians have been paying for the British colonial policy of, desire, of divide and rule and for Europe's guilty Christian conscience for more than 30 years. Finally, there is absolutely, repeat, absolutely no hope of establishing peace in what Europe so arrogantly calls the Middle East without dealing with the Palestinians. And so this was something from someone who most of their writing is about liberation and oppression and, and imperialism. So I, and of course, I never saw this connection then. So would you just talk a little bit about the history here and when, because I know there have been several points in, in black history in America where there has been more of a connection to what is going on in, um, with Palestinians. Sure, thanks for having me. It's great to, great to be back with you guys. Um, I, I, I think it's, um, it's historic. I, I, the first people, uh, black people in the U.S. Uh, to talk about this uh, uh, dilemma of the creation of the state of Israel uh, as a settler colonial project, as a uh, product of imperialism, of British imperialism. And it goes back a long way to, I mean, people think about, I don't know, Lawrence of Arabia or something like that, which tells right. you the European powers, how they carved up the Middle East, how they created some of these countries. You know, the borders of Iraq were created by Winston Churchill or something like that. So, so there were people, uh, anti-imperialist people, the Paul Robesons, the W.E.B. Du Bois and others who spoke um, uh, about Zionism and the problematic nature of Zionism pretty early on. Um, we had uh, uh, people like Malcolm X who uh, visited Palestine in the early 60s and wrote about it, wrote a column called on Zionist logic, I, I believe um, it was called. But uh, support sure. for the Palestinian people, for their human rights has been always been a mainstay of uh, the black radical tradition. Um, but uh, as that uh, tradition was marginalized politically, uh, along with, um, as uh, you were uh, saying in the previous segment, uh, marginalized politically, it's something that has been uh, uh, ignored or uh, condemned or um, as, as you were saying, people can very easily be called anti-Semitic uh, if they deviate from the support Israel, no questions asked narrative at all. Or if somebody makes a problematic, inelegant statement about Jewish people in the United States, Jesse Jackson's campaign, the Jaime Town right. remark was, I mean, it's decades later, it's still brought up. Um, so uh, it's a very, very long history. It goes into the, uh, the present day. Black Lives Matter, the organization, made a, a brief uh, uh, statement in support of the Palestinian people uh, 2021 in May. Uh, it was very, I thought, reasonable. But if you want to uh, marginalize anyone who says anything in support of Palestinians, then, of course, that makes it problematic when it isn't. But uh, we have a very long and strong history here of um, uh, people making the connections with um, uh, uh, apartheid as, that, as was practiced in South Africa and, and feeling um, uh, comfortable because it's, you know, the evidence is there that Israel is also an apartheid state. But the problem, of course, comes from the opposition. Uh, which is uh, Israel gets bipartisan support. Um, and as um, the other things that you were uh, discussing happen to black people. But I think um, 
it's even worse. There is, you know, when black people step out of line on anything, the punishment is always more severe. You had people losing seats in Congress, people of being afraid of losing uh, even any elected office. It can be even a local office like uh, here in New York in the city council. So those are some of the things that I uh, want to bring up today. Yeah, no, I think it's really important. And I think that one of the things that always had, I had heard like growing up, whenever somebody who was black would speak in favor of anything Palestinian, of course they'd be is anti-Semitic, but then there was this additional thing that was always thrown in. And this was definitely a Jewish community type of thing where, mm -hmm. but we're so good to them. We're so <laughs> Jews have always supported black. Jews have always supported black. Like that's the kind of like thought process. And it was almost like they, and I say they, I, I mean, I, I never said that, but that was the, the cultural thing. But it was almost like these Jews were taking themselves completely out of the fact that, yes, but you're also white. You're also part of the imperialist Western Eurocentric problem. So <laughs> you can't, you can't disable that, but they're like, but we've always been good to the blacks. Like they really, and I'm telling you, literally, that's what I've heard. Say just, to, just, just take your cookie and be thankful. And they that's really couldn't works. wrap their head around it. And to some extent, I feel like that also is very the same thing for the, how the Democratic Party treats blacks. It's almost like, but well, we've been so good to you. Come out and vote for us. We've been so good to you. How could you not like us? Well, but you're right. I, and I know those uh, people who, um, uh, I remember the, the former mayor of New York City, Ed Koch, uh, who I never liked. But anyway, he's now dead. But I'm, I, I don't feel like I can't say that I dislike somebody who's now uh, Wait, wait, before you departed, go on, I've got anyway. an aunt. It's a famous quote from my aunt. If you have nothing good to say about the dead, say nothing. They're dead. Good. There you go. <laughs> so he, uh, Koch was... Um, you know, a problematic uh, figure in New York City. Pro I think he served three terms in late 70s. Um, um, I, I, I'm sorry, I think mostly the 80s and uh, early 90s. He um, he was the, he was there in the late 70s to so the early mid 80s. That was his that was his that time. was it. OK, um, oh, that's right. He was late 70s. No, it was 12 terms. Sorry, I'm thinking. I know he left office in night. So it's like late 70s to like 1989 he was mayor or 90. Till, he was mayor till David Dinkins. And I think, right, I think it's 1990. Years. But in any case, he was, uh, thank you, um, very problematic person. I, I always felt he was a racist. Most black people did. Uh, but he was a um, very much dedicated Zionist uh, to the point where he uh, it, when uh, uh, Reagan ran against Carter, I guess that was 1980, he practically endorsed Reagan. I mean, he had this party for him at Gracie Mansion. And then he said, well, I didn't actually use the word endorsement, but he was he was angry about some uh, UN vote uh, at the UN that Carter had um, uh, supported. But he, um, uh, in his racism, um, his paternalist, very paternalistic and nasty, but he was a nasty person anyway, um, uh, attitude towards black New Yorkers, he would always say, but I marched in the South, but I went down for the freedom rides. And that was always <laughs> one of the things that's supposed to shut black people up. All somebody has to say is I fill in the blank with Dr. King. Right. I went down South. I protested against segregation. And that was supposed to be um, uh, the thing that would quiet any, um, uh, uh, criticism from black people. So he is an example, and I'm thinking of him as a prominent person who used to do that. But I've been, you know, and I can imagine him saying, I've been good to black people. I, I, went, so I, went, to, I went to Mississippi in Freedom Summer. So what the hell? You know, everybody just be quiet. So uh, I think um, that's definitely something that uh, does still happen. And now with the Democratic Party, it's even worse because, you know, it's like the, the Republican Party or the, the racist white people's party. And uh, we not only get this, you know, haven't we been good to you? I mean, it's been decades since you can think of anything uh, significant as far as I'm concerned. And those things happen as a result of the mass movement. So it was not like some benevolent act. Um, so it's, well, you have nowhere to go. 
you don't have anywhere else to go. What are you going to do? Are you gonna? And they still, you know, I feel like Donald, uh, there needs to be a statute of limitation on Donald Trump's name. Uh, well, you know, it could be like Trump, you know, is, is that what you want again? So we get this double and triple whammy totally. of, um, of uh, uh, this, this kind of a blackmail, political blackmail and vote shaming and uh, racism uh, that can all be wrapped up together when Israel is uh, the topic of discussion. Right. And I, I also think that in certain parts of like the more left, in the real left, not the political left, the actual left, um, <laughs> that it's just common sense. It's common sense that oppressed people would relate to other oppressed people. Um, it's really not a stretch. And where it really becomes difficult, and I think especially here, is that most of the, I would say, centrist people, Jews in particular, still do not acknowledge that they are actually oppressing people. They don't. There's the, the amount of mental gymnastics that is required to, to be a liberal kind of, you know, Jew towing the line, oh, we need a two-state solution, whatever your little talking point is, the mental gymnastics is exhausting. And quite honestly, that's where I finally was like, you know what, I, I, I am way too old and I just, <laughs> I cannot keep doing this dance. And I think that people in the black community, they've just seen it before so many times. It's so commonplace that, yeah, there's people being oppressed. Of course, there's people being oppressed. And I think that when we're talking about the Jewish community, by and large, is not, in this country, is not an oppressed people. In fact, they're generally a thriving people in this country. Yeah. And so they don't understand, well, what are we doing wrong? They're allowed, wait, they, and the best one is, they allow Palestinians, to, they have parties, they're in parliament, they allow them to have votes. Right. Like it's it's the same uh, mentality. And it's like, yes, well, black people can vote here, too. Does that mean that their votes are properly? Doing well, that? you know, uh, another thing that that happens here is I'm, I was thinking about this about this as I listened to you talk. There's this collusion where the media hides the worst um, policies in Israel. So, for example, uh, not only can Palestinians be evicted from their homes, but the government forces people to tear down their own house. And if you don't tear down your own house, they charge you uh, money for destroying, they're going to destroy your home. But if they do instead of you, then you're charged this fine of uh, thousands of dollars of little kids being used as human shields, the people right. who are in prison. I mean, I could, I could go on. I, you what all know term? this stuff. Yeah, What's but... Uh, um, it's something that the media hide. Uh, so, for example, when uh, Amnesty International uh, finally said what they should have said years ago, that Israel is an apartheid state, they were either condemned or, in the case of the New York Times, they just did not report it, ever. Right. They just never reported it. <laughs> so you hide the worst things. All of the things that most sensible people would look at and say, well, that's wrong. So those things are hidden, and uh, I, I think it helps people who are going through those mental gymnastics to defend their position because they get to use all the positive talking points. Well, there's Arabs in parliament. There's something like that. With, and, but they're not confronted with the things that, that no one can deny are the nature of an apartheid state. So, and there's political collusion um, where uh, politicians are, um, so for example, here in, in uh, New York City where I live, members of the city council, now they're local elected officials. They don't have anything to do with foreign policy, but they always make these junkets to Israel, always. And whoever's the head of the city council, uh, when there's, you know, the next attack on Gaza will say, we stand with Israel. Israel is being terrorized, you know, while there are people, other people in Gaza being terrorized. Uh, so that sends a message that even if uh, you're a local or state elected official and you don't have anything to do with foreign policy, you, it's clear that's where the line is going to be towed. If you want to raise money and you have to raise money to run for office, then you won't get money. Or somebody who runs against you will get money instead of you. All of those things serve to, um, to silence. 
and but the people aren't fooled and so you may um uh, uh, people may silence themselves but they have not changed their minds i think 90 percent of black people if you ask them uh would say that just to in a very general terms, they know black that Palestinians are being treated unfairly. They know they're being oppressed, and they want that to stop. Uh, but uh, all of these things that we've talked about um, uh, diminish that uh, level of uh, outspokenness that people should have. Thanks for watching. If you want to support our mission to transform politics into service, please like this video, subscribe, follow us on social media, and consider joining our Patreon, where you'll get early access to our interviews as well as other exclusive content. Links are in the description. Peace out.